Hi, I just want to do a brief introduction to radicals as part of a, an introduction to the radical course that I give at, at Honours at Stellenbosch University. Uh, and it's just a, an overview of, uh, of, of what radicals can do. Uh, but by now, you, you, you would know that, of course, radicals are uh, atoms with a single uh, unpaired electron in the, in the outer orbital and that they can do a whole lot of reactions. We're just going to hone in now on kind of synthesis what happens, uh, particularly in our CC bond forming reactions. These are the ones that are the most important uh, ones that we see now. Uh, in terms, this is huge, of course, radical chemistry is huge in polymer chemistry. Uh, for instance, when we polymerize ethylene and we make it into polyethylene, uh, it's, it's radical chemistry that's occurring as um, we join all the bits to uh, bits together. Uh, but we're not going to be doing polymer chemistry. We want to look at, at molecules which have a lot more functional groups on them and the way they're put together. And briefly, the way there are two kind of main uh, types of reactions that are occurring in radical chemistry. The the harder one is your intermolecular uh, type of reaction. This is actually the, the the polymer type of reaction, and why it's more difficult is because in organic chemistry and synthetic chemistry we're dealing with more complicated molecules than than simple. Uh, uh, monomers that make up the polymer chemistry. Uh, but as an example, just to as, as a means of kind of looking at this, we take, for instance, a cyclopenta, uh, a cyclopenta pentyl radical, and we can react it with a Michael acceptor, which is methyl acrylate, uh, and it can do you know, kind of this typical Michael type chemistry that we should be used to and very familiar with. And we can make a new carbon carbon bond uh, and draw this out and um, and of course we actually end up directly off this we're going to get another radical over there but the point here is that we've we've made this new carbon carbon bond over there and that's a type of an intermolecular uh, radical reaction and they're a little bit more difficult they definitely work we're going to see exam plenty of examples of them uh, and uh, but we have to learn the rules about what works and what doesn't work so well uh, from the synthetic chemistry point of view. And then the other one, of course, if you've got the intermolecular, obviously you've got the other one is the intramolecular. And these ones are a lot more useful for uh, for uh, organic chemistry, where we're actually making cyclic structures. Okay, so we're going from something as an example. If I go and draw this out here. Um, this molecule there, we've got a radical on one end, we've got an acceptor group, and alkene radicals love reacting with alkenes, uh, and uh, that radical can react with it. And we're going to have to learn the rules in terms of exactly how they react, what where they prefer to go. I'm just going to tell you right now that the radical actually prefers to go to the carbon on the inside of this and make the smaller ring, okay, one, two, three, four, five membered ring, as opposed to a one, two, three, four, five, six membered uh, ring like that. And so when this closes in, we're going to get this five-membered ring like that uh, with the radical sitting on the outside. Okay, so these are a lot more common and are very important. We want to be looking out for these when we uh, do reactions, uh, particularly with molecules with lots of functional groups on, uh, on them. Okay, what I want to do now is I want to just give a brief overview of the different uh, chemistries involved in radical formation. And there's just four that we're going to be looking at and how we generate uh, a radical in the first place. All right, so we're going to be looking at generating radicals, and briefly uh, speaking, one of the easiest ways is just through a, a homolytic bond cleavage. Uh, this can best be described, uh, or an example given is just looking at bromine, uh, and if we take bromine and we add uh, light to it, H nu, uh, we can get a homolytic bond cleavage. So that means that bond breaks nice and evenly. Each each bromine gets one electron, and we get Br dot. Okay, and obviously there are two of them over there. And and this is useful. We we use uh, radical br bromine in organic chemistry, and we'll look at some examples. But it's fairly limited. There's not a lot of stuff that we would do with this this type of chemistry. The the biggest chemistry actually comes from uh, the the element tin, uh, and the tin chemistry is very important in terms of generating carbon radicals. Th there are problems with tin, we'll deal with that, but uh, just there is a lot of chemistry around it. Uh, just briefly, uh, an example, how does it, how will tin actually generate a radical? Well, if we have 
a molecule with a halogen on it like this. A tin radical, uh, and the most common one that gets used is tributyl tin radical, that one will pick up the iodine because the tin iodine bond is stronger and but does it in a homolytic sense so we can break this bond uh, and we're going to end up with the cyclopen so cyclohexyl radical and then uh, tin uh, iodide as a, a side product. All right, so that's one way of, of generating a carbon radical using using tin. Of course, your question would then be, well, how did you generate the tin radical in the first place? Well, that's also uh, easy to answer. The tin radical can be generated from uh, a molecule of tin hydride, tributyl tin hydride, that reacts with it. So this this carbon radical can pick up this hydrogen, and then we're left with a tin hydride, which can... But of course now, the usefulness of this might not be terribly exciting. And of course, there's still a chicken and an egg scenario going on over here. Uh, if you need this to generate the tin, but the tin has to generate this, what's generating things in the first place? Uh, and the answer to that is, a, is another special molecule. There are a number of these types of molecules. A very common one is AIBN, which is a radical initiator. Those of you who study polymer science will know what's going on over here. So AIBN is uh, azer isobutyryl nitrile. So it's there's a there's the azer part over there, and we've got a nitrile, four carbons, it's the butyryl, and it looks like that. And the thing with this, which is nice, sorry, this should be the other way around. I don't like it that way. Um, <clears throat> the thing about this one is that the bond over here is actually very weak. And if we heat it up just to like 80 degrees Celsius, this breaks down homolytically and we get uh, electrons going in like that. And we release nitrogen. So that drives it thermodynamically, it goes off as a gas, and we get this. Uh, nitrile radical like that. And this one over here is going to pick up the hydrogen of the tin, uh, generating the tin radical, which then can get the all the reactions going. And there's a lot of stuff that's dealt with that. We're going to have to build quite a bit of uh, up, up into in, in class on, on that area. Um, so quickly, the last three, uh, we've got tin. There's boron chemistry, which is very important as well. So boron, particularly the trialkyl boranes, uh, so, for instance, ET3B, in the presence of just air is enough, it's just the oxygen that's in there, but just using open, to, open vessel to the air, um, we generate the ET radical, uh, plus then there's a, the, the remainder, the ET2 uh, that's remaining, and the oxygen that's, which itself is a di radical. Uh, uh, it remains and we get this and this is going to break down further. It's not too important to worry about that. The ET radical we can use. Uh, we can use that to do certain things just like we have a cyclohexyl radical over here. But more often than not, this ET radical, the importance of it is actually like the AIBN over here. It's useful as a, uh, a radical initiator, particularly because this thing over here, although we can do this at room temperature, actually also works to temperatures as low as minus 78 degrees Celsius. And that's going to be very important in terms of getting some stereo control in radical type reactions. Okay, so we will come back to that. Uh, another important radical uh, um, reagent is samarium iodide. So samarium iodide is great at uh, giving its electrons away, going from samarium 2 to samarium 3. Um, typically, there are other reactions, and we're going to cover there's a whole host of things here, but typically one of the more important ones is its ability to take a carbonyl compound and reduce that, uh, uh, reduce that to the ketal radical. So that looks like that. So we've got a dot next door on the carbon of the oxygen, and the oxygen becomes minus. So what's happening here is your samarium 2, uh, donates an electron to the oxygen and then this fragments and we end up with a ketal radical and we have samarium I2 over there. And there are a lot of important reactions which are related to, to that as well. So we're going to look at samarium and then just briefly, this is one of the smaller ones we're going to look at, is the bis-cyclopentadienyl 
uh, titanium chloride. And this one, uh, uh, amongst some of the reactions which are similar to samarium iodide, is that it can convert epoxide. So if we take this epoxide over here and we treat it with that reagent, the titanium reagent, titanium chloride, CP2, uh, we can generate this type of radical over here. Okay, O, titanium, this chlorine, and the two CPs. Okay, so this one is, is also important in terms of just a different way of forming, forming radicals. So these are the four ways that we're going to be looking at and we're going to cover when we do the, ke the chemistry of radicals, plus we're going to have to look at a lot of the selectivity, a lot of the, um, the ways that these things all fit together. All right, so I look forward to teaching this to you.